so uh, you had some bullshit thing you wanted to bring up on recording, and I already forget what it was. Patrons? That's not bullshit. That's something else. <laughs> <laughs> Patrons are not bullshit. No. You were like, and I'm going to say that on air. And I went, oh, oh, um. I don't know how to remember to give you the on ramp to make that sound organic. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, nope, don't remember. That's fine. If it, I don't think it was that important. I think it was more of a joke. I was gonna, say, I was gonna get out there and tell them off. I don't know who they were anymore, but consider yourselves told off. You know who you consider are. Consider who you are. You know what you did. You were told <laughs> off. <laughs> you know what you did. You know what you did. We don't, but you do. No, I, I've completely forgotten because I had you know five minutes since I had that thought, but I, uh, but. That brings me back to the one thing I did remember that I wanted to do, which was patrons, because I do want to try and keep up with that as much as possible. While Seth is looking that up, I do want to remind you on behalf of Zool that WatCon tickets for in-person attendance at WatCon can be purchased through June 14th, which is real soon, actually, because it is currently June 4th. So that is in 10 days, which is actually after this episode is going to come out. So only you people in live are getting this reminder but consider yourselves reminded. And uh, digital attendance tickets will be on sale after the in-person ticket sales close or something like that. All right, so we've got four new patrons I want to thank on this episode. Uh, I want to start with probably one of my favorite Patreon names. Will the real Demondrid please stand up? <laughs> now, for those of you who are not aware and haven't listened to the podcast recently, I have a certain theory about um, Vannon. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got Taim, who could have been Demondred, and then, of course, Demondred, who eventually shows up. So I love that name, just because you've got all these good potential Demondreds. And then we all speculated about it for ages and ages. Indeed. So next, we would like to thank Alexander Nava. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. Help me with this last name. <laughs> Sukareva? Sukareva? Uh, so thank you to Stephanie Sukareva. Did my best on that last name, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I love our Canadian uh, folks. Yes, we do. We do love our wolfkin to the yeah. north. <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we would like to thank Peter Boss. You are the boss. I'm sure you've never heard that before. Not once in your life. I'm, you're so welcome for that original commentary. Now, see, I got to go with the whole name, Peter Marie Boss, because, like, I read everybody's name as they put it into Patreon. I assume that's how they want it to be read, so. I... Okay. Okay. Peter Middle Marie names. Boss. Peter Marie thank Boss. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I can't pick and choose. I can't say, will the real please stand up? I feel like that's not, you know, uh, you can't yeah, skip that's... words in the middle of the name just okay. because it's, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will put whatever you put into that name and I will read it. I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everyone was totally Behave. aware that their full names were going to go into that, but you know, it's not like anyone listens to this podcast. Well, you know, there there's two there's places you can put your name full name and then you can put your display name, right? So there is actually a, a difference. No. Oh. I, my my Patreons are mostly just so set and forget. I like sure. haven't looked at any sure. of that stuff in so long. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and just keeping up with the Patreon uh, webpage sometimes can be a little crazy. Man, mm -hmm. they keep changing it. And I, I'm just not on it often enough because we don't run our community through the Patreon webpage. We run it through Discord. Right, right, right. They've added a bunch of stuff s since we've had our thing going to try to basically capture what we're doing. I've also noticed Spreaker has now basically created an in-house Patreon because mm -hmm. they're you know they're all converging on the same thing realizing what us you know various podcasters have been cobbling together through these various platforms so they're all trying to create the same functions but you know we got in kind of early on these platforms so we just have our you know cobbled together system and ignore the updates as they go by and then yeah every now and then it's like oh boy this place has changed yeah yeah all around like, whoa okay i need to find that information in a totally different place yeah, a little disconcerting sometimes. And, you know, back when I was young, I used to keep up with all the software changes and all the things that were relevant to me, and it's just not possible anymore. Like, the, the software landscape has become so big and so diversified. But at the same time, I still use some of my favorite programs 
uh, that I used to use 10, 15, 20 years ago. They just keep getting updated and because they're good programs, right? Like, I still watch videos with VLC, right? Like... You know, right? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, Winamp still whips the llama's ass. Mm. It, just, <laughs> it just does. Like that's just what it does. This is the Wheel of Time spoilers podcast. All right. Well, do you want to talk about uh, the beating montage? It's just such an awkward way to put it. <laughs> but yes, well, yes it's a this... montage interrupted with beatings, I suppose. Okay. My, uh, the issue I have with this chapter, and I love this chapter, right? I'm not. I don't want to knock on this chapter, but she keeps saying things like every two or three days, and then she says things like on day two, and it's like, well, is it every two or three days, or are you on day two? Because there's no way that things are happening with any sort of regularity if you're only on day two or three. Yeah, it's a little little screwy on the timeline for sure. That is true. And yes, it is definitely a montage of interesting things interspersed with beating scenes, which are kind of feel a little unnecessarily egregious by the end. But just like she tells Lelaine, it's, you know, she tells Lelaine, Listen, I've been beaten all these times. I am not going to break. If I've been beaten this much and I haven't broken yet, there's nothing they can do to me because they have to heal me, right? Like, and I think that's what Jordan's trying to say to us is the same thing he's saying is that Egwene's saying to Lelaine, which is she's not going to break, right? Like, this is a legitimate strategy. Yeah, for sure. And I want to be upfront to anyone who's been following my, like, discussions of this, these books over time. You may have heard me call this the Nelson Mandela arc. And, um... I recently listened to, I believe it was Throughline, did like an hour long podcast about like the man, the myth, the legend, Nelson Mandela. And um, it's a really poor comparison. I've just been saying it because it's like, ooh, inspiring leader gets imprisoned and messed with a whole bunch. But like, there's just so few comparisons I can actually draw between those things. So I'm going to stop calling it that arc and... And just, yeah, if, if you happened to pick that up from me, just like, uh, I will put the link to the Thruland episode in the thing. Because it's just like, it's not like it's offensive. It's just inaccurate. So can you explain what you thought, the compar- why the comparison made sense, and then now why it doesn't, and why you don't want to use it anymore? Just because Egwene's whole thing is being, like, beaten, and her, I mean, I guess, just because of the duration of it, Nelson Mandela was locked away for 27 years. And it was just such a much more complicated thing where they were, like, attacking him through his family, through social isolation, sometimes through torture, sometimes through coercion. Like, just so many different things. And it was, like, the whole apparatus of the state for all these years. Whereas Egwene is, like, in a contest of wills for a week. I, you know? Like, this chapter, this montage takes a week. It's nine days. So it's a Randland week. And it just feels like the time scales are so out of sync that, like, however epic Egwene is... Nelson Mandela did it for longer than she's been alive. And so it just feels like they're so deeply out of scale that like, ah, again, I don't think I was being offensive per se. It's just like this just now I've learned it. I'm like, I can't anymore. This just feels really hollow. (laughs) Like this is just me not knowing what I'm talking about. Like there are surely better political prisoners to compare Egwene to. Like, just because he's the most famous person who's imprisoned that I know of off the top of my head. Like, that's not a good reason to compare this. No, but I can see why you would say, okay, this would be the Nelson Mandela arc. This is the point at which he's imprisoned, tortured, and comes out of it the leader. Right? Like, there, the, the, the superficial parallels are there, whether or not the detail is. Yeah, and I mean, and the conflict is different, right? This is more of a, like civil war between two parties that were equal kind of thing whereas again nelson mandela's thing was like ending apartheid which is starting from a and discrimination inherently and yeah, unequal right. like socio-political situation like it's just how can you compare the rebels to the anti-apartheid people like there's just there's no apartheid there's just like this this little civil war between siblings that's happening it's just very how if, if anyone wants to tell me that it actually is a great parallel like Great, but I'd I'd be more interested to know what struggles actually compare to this because I do think that the leadership qualities that we admire in someone like Nelson Mandela are exemplified by Egwene and many other leaders. And I just, 
would love to find the right parallel from the real world to compare her to because she does rock this whole section Egwene is like amazing so I want to know who in the real world she could actually be compared to in a way that has some like interesting historical mnemonics to it rather than just like except for this except for this except for this that's all um I guess I should probably wet my whistle to do a read-in uh while you're doing that wedding update wedding favors have been for the most part constructed dialing final details we got a costco membership yesterday so that we can go buy things for the wedding at costco wow so yeah lots of ideas lots of finalizing and um more stress than i expected and probably more stress than i need because it's all self-inflicted yeah it sounds like you've got everything well under control and don't need to stress incredibly under control i don't need to stress at all it's really it's amazing how well it's all coming together which, of course, means that my brain is going, it's coming together too well. Something's going to go wrong. Stress! <laughs> uh, oh, can't God, win. our brain's fun. No, you can't, really can't. You really can't. It's, uh, it's amazing how brains work. Let's distract ourselves with a really excellently written chapter from our comfort <laughs> series. Chapter 24, Honey in the Tea. And our symbol is the Flame of Tarvalon. Egwene knew from the start that her strange captivity would be difficult. Yet she believed that embracing pain as the Aeel did would be the easiest part. After all, she had been beaten severely when she paid her toe to the wise ones for lying, strapped by one after another in turn, so she had experience. But embracing pain did not mean just giving way to it rather than fighting. You had to draw the pain inside of you and welcome it as a part of you. Avienda said you must be able to smile and laugh with joy or sing while the worst of the pain still gripped you. That was not so easy at all. And I have no desire to actually read the beating scene, so we're going to stop there. Because <laughs> that's just weird. Was that a shorter read-in than I was expecting? Yes, because the next paragraph is the actual beating scene, and I didn't actually want to read that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could slip away for a second. I was like, all right. No, um, it's totally valid. I was just like, I don't, I don't actually want to read Egwene being beaten directly. That's, that doesn't seem necessary. <laughs> Yeah, so we are in, yeah, a beating montage. Um, and this beginning part is just like a very in-depth description of her being beaten. Yeah, and the only thing that I think is interesting is how she discovers that if she just allows the experience to pass through her, then it goes away very quickly. And this is something that anyone who's ever, you know, sworn vituperatively while stubbing their toe has experienced, right? Mm -hmm. You take the pain in, you let it pass through you, you don't get attached to it, it goes away. That's kind of what she's doing. She's not holding on to it. She's just letting it happen, and then you reach equilibrium after much faster. It, it also seems to be that she's starting off by, like, screaming and yelling as loud as she can, right? She's letting as much out. So that's why, and, and Sylviana's like, oh, I would have beat you harder, but in the beginning it seemed I was really getting through to you, right? Like, yeah, this is yeah, the first yeah. beating, uh -huh, right? And Egwene's uh -huh. screaming and thrashing and, you know, she's doing all the things that she can do to sort of ex just accept, like, this is my reaction to being beaten. Yeah, yeah. And it's only later that Sylviana's like, uh, it's not really working, is it? <laughs> Right, yeah, because Egwene just goes through that experience every time and just gets calmer faster at the end. Mm -hmm. She's just mm -hmm. as upset during, but then the the calmness after, that's what is matters. almost instantaneous, yeah, right. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, a very real part of being human. Like, holding out against the pain and trying to ignore it and trying to push it away and, you know, being very rand about it, like... It, it that tends to create tension and chronic illness in your body whereas just letting it all through is like okay i can move on with my life and there is something th this series very much talks about like accepting pain like we see rand living with pain chronic pain right we see Egwene sort of accepting pain and, and not letting it stop them from living their lives which is i you know Something I, thank goodness, don't have to do. <laughs> right? I don't know if I could, honestly. Like, it's, it, it, I mean, it, once you have to, you have to, I suppose. And you do have to, like, be within the limits of that, which these heroes don't have to. They just get to power through because they're teenagers who are severe and, and have magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a certain amount of, like, I can just ignore that and it doesn't affect me at all and I'm still... You know, well, there's a, there's a line later where, you know, she's like, oh, and I didn't get much sleep and that's not a problem. And I'm just like, 
you're in pain, you're exhausted, and you won't admit it to yourself, right? Like, I can only imagine what I would do to get an extra couple of hours of sleep, pain-free sleep. Yeah. So it is amazing that she's able to just ignore that. And there's a certain amount of, well, it's I'm saving the world, so therefore I should just be able to. Yeah, the part where she's able to reframe it as a badge of honor to be taking these wounds in battle and it's easy to welcome a badge of honor is like, I, I mean, mentally I kind of get it, but also like that's some pretty demigod level mental gymnastics too. Like, But on the other hand, I've sat for dozens of hours of tattooing. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Like, there is definitely a part of me that's like, well, yeah, I mean, I will willingly subject myself to pain and, like, even laugh and smile through it because I want the end result that comes from that and it's fine. So, like, but it's it's self-induced for art. It's not being literally beaten. It's having, like, a little ink, ink injected in my skin for beautification. It's just, they're not truly comparable. This is not an actual, like, bone-deep injury. Right. The closest I can come to it is, uh, you know, di- being a distant swimmer and forcing myself to just keep going through the pain hour after hour for these, you know, incredible distance events I used to swim. And I, again, don't know how I did it at that age, but I guess there's a certain amount of, like, acceptance of the pain. Right? I, I don't know. It, it impresses me. Yeah. It impresses me. It's and different kinds <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Is I guess there are different kinds of pain, and I think it's hard to 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 say, you know, you can have chronic pain, you can have acute pain, you can have uh, muscle pain, you can have tattooing pain, you can have beating pain. Right? Those are all incredibly different, yet no less painful. Right? Or painful in very different ways. Right. And the reasons for it are different. And I mean, this is where, yeah. like, you know, the parallel to a political prisoner like Mandela, who did, you know, get physically tortured, among other things, during his imprisonment is comparable. Because, like, yeah, being physically beaten until you agree to a different set of rules is an old play. This is a thing that people do all the time. It's terrible, but, like, it is a very real thing that happens. And so, and some people don't respond to it they're like no fuck you i'm not going to change my principles other people totally fold for it like it doesn't mean that they believe any differently they're just not willing to deal with the pain but some people some people do some people absolutely do and put up with it for years and years and years and just you know do that so it's not like Egwene is genuinely a a work of fiction like real people have been as epic uh it's just really hard for us to imagine from our plush little lives (laughs) I, I always really think of um, the Chain of Command, the Star Trek episode where uh, Picard is taken prisoner and he's beaten until he's basically there. There are four lights on the wall and the, the guy who is beating him wants to, him to say there are five, basically lie about reality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, mm-hmm. and, and so it's this whole thing where it's like he's, he's basically tortured until he denies the reality in front of him. Um, and, and so it's, it's a great episode. I highly recommend it. But that reminds me a lot of what's going on here, where it's it's more of a shorter term beating, right? right? It's also fictional, obviously, a shorter term prison sentence where, you know, he's in prison for about a week and he's starved for about a week. And there's just a lot more mind games going on, right? Like, because he is in a cell. Right. Um, so they fuck, they fuck with him on time. They fuck with him on food. They fuck with him on, like, on just what is reality, which they're not necessarily trying to do here with Egwene. They've already lied to themselves about what is reality and then just assume that she's going to be part of that. Yeah, they're, it's it's less of a gaslighting and more of a mutually exclusive definitions of what is. Right, right, and right. one is going... To, it's, it's what happens with Masana, really. Right, Masana and Egwene's confrontation until I run Riyadh is not a gaslighting game. It's a sheer force of wills whose reality is true. Like, it's not that there is a true objective reality. It's that we are fighting over who gets to define objective reality. Mm-hmm. Right, in, in, in the whole winner gets to determine who was right. Exactly, exactly. You know, like, the the winner gets to say what is reality in this case. Yeah, we're wrong unless we win, in which case we were right the whole time. It's that kind of thing. So we get some rules about how she's going to, you know, she's going to obey some orders, but not others, right? She's not going to curtsy to anyone. She's not going to call anyone I said I, but whatever, I, you know, she has three or four of these rules where it's like, I'm willing to go this far, but no further. Right. Yeah. She has to toe a line 
of obedience to the conditions of her imprisonment without giving up her claims of being the Amarlin in prison. Right. And that is, that's tough. You know, there's a lot of thinking around. Like, I, I really like the way he deals with uh, the other novices, where instead of like... All right, Zool, that was fucking funny. That totally, that this rail being a, <laughs> to toe the line. That's good. T O H. Nice, nice. nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like how he deals with the other novices. That it's not she doesn't deal with them on their level. She's just like, yeah, no, I'm clearly not a novice anymore because I can do things that no novice can do. Yeah, it's a, it's an unusual prison sentence, and she figures out the conditions of that prison sentence like on the fly. And I think a lot of that has to do with how Swan has counseled her on what it means to be Amarlin. So she knows what yes. she can compromise on and what she can't compromise on and what will make the critical subconscious psychological differences in her you know, chain of command, so to speak, and how she presents herself in the hierarchy and people who respond according to that kind of programming respond accordingly because she plays the game like Swan would, which despite being you know let more than half her age less than half her age <laughs> right no in a lot of ways swan is to uh Egwene as lewis theron is to rand which yeah, is this voice of yeah, like a yeah. uh, reason and experience in their head that's telling them to to do things that they wouldn't otherwise know how to do yeah what would swan do is basically just how yeah, Egwene navigates yeah. this except for not quite <laughs> because swan set up the conditions by which elida could do a coup so like it's a little different but you know the basics of what swan knows not swan's personality whereas rand has a uh, wwltd yeah yeah except not the voice in his head right like that's the thing is ltt in his head is not lewis there and telemon no that's just lose yeah that's just ltt yeah you know? or yeah just ltt the acronym yeah we also see alviarin yep going for her penance because we saw her getting assigned that penance when she got dismissed as keeper because she had ordered Elida beaten so many times. Elida's like, you're right. going to take 10 for every one, which means we're going to be here for a minute. Ooh, yeah, it's going to be a while. But yeah, uh, and, and you know, Egwene's like, well, I wonder why Alviarin's by herself. I wonder if that means anything. Yeah, she's Black Aja, right? Like, Well, and she's been shunned by the White really hard for losing the stole. Yes, right, right. Egwene thinks, well, there's no way that the White are shunning her. Like, there's not, like, the Rock can't have gone that far. And it's like, no, they totally are. They're completely shunning her for having lost the stole. That's absolutely what's happening. The rot has gone that far. And so she's got this pair of... This is the first time she's been beaten, so she's leaving. We're seeing a lot of these things for the first time. She's got two red sisters who are with her who are not guards, but they're not not guards. <laughs> the skirts divided for riding of guards. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're not pants. But they're not? Not pants. But no, but this is the sentence. They were not precisely guards. And then again, they were not precisely not guards. Okay. That's verbatim from the book. I'm not, that is absolutely something that Jordan wrote. They're not precisely not guards. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a little yeah. too close. Yeah. It's real yeah. funny. It's like RJ is just winking and nodding at us. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I love it when he does a double negative there. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, that was that was a fun little line. I read that and I was like, ha Yeah. Pants. I knew. <laughs> yeah, I highlighted it for exactly the same reason. Like, there it is, there it is. <laughs> I love that she gets her own clothes back from when she was accepted. They just like dust them off and hand them to, right back to her. They're like, Welcome back. Like you haven't been gone long enough for these to have gotten cycled onto another girl yet. <laughs> and that's oh, there's a line in here where she says, "Oh my God, back when I was 16." And I'm like, you know, a year and a half ago. Jesus. She's like, I barely remember being that young. I'm like, you still have teen in your age, my girl. Uh -huh, shush. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Shush your And will for another mouth. two years. Yeah. <laughs> Egwene. I mean, was I con being that self pretentious about myself at that age and going, oh, yes, but I was 16. I was such a child. But now at 18, I'm so. Yes, I was doing that. I am guilty as charged. I recognize what Egwene is doing because I did it too. It's my argument for why I've never gotten tattoos. Five years ago, I was a fucking idiot. And that's been true my entire life. <laughs> 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 looks at my tattooed body <laughs> and do i want that guy putting tattoos on my body hell no well my wheel of time tattoo is how we met so you know no i yeah well <laughs> 
but no, it's it's uh, choosing a tattoo when you know how much you change over time is hard. Like, what yeah. am I going to be okay with in five years? And that's part of why Wheel of Time was my first really ginormous tattoo was because I was like, at this point, I will never not have gone through the phase in my life where I was obsessed with Wheel of Time. So even if I never read it again, it still had that impression on me. So it's safe. And Robert Jordan's dead. So he can't say anything terrible that will make me upset. <laughs> so I'm safe. <laughs> And then, of course, Warriors of uh, Altai came out. So it's like, obviously, dead people can still say things you didn't know. But like, yeah, yeah, you know. Well, but, you know, he'd written Conan the Barbarian already. So it's not like there was nothing in Warriors of the Altai that wasn't in his Conan books. Yeah, which I just, you know, conveniently memory hole every time someone brings up. <laughs> just I, I don't like that sentence, so I choose to ignore it. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. Robert Jordan's other books were incredibly sexist Conan books and books glorifying the south hmm. hmm anyway so wheel of time let's move yeah, on yeah. <laughs> but yeah my tattoos went in order of wedding ring flowers to help me stay chill in college fandom favorite bird whatever my artist wanted to put on me because it was a cheaper rate and i just wanted a tattoo <laughs> that was my chain of reasoning so you can see the descent. Once you have a few, you're like, ah, sure, just like give me a cool tattoo, do whatever, it'll be fine. Well, yeah, I mean, ab <laughs> there's there's absolutely a certain amount of inertia to getting tattoos, right? Like the first one is always going to be the hardest. Oh yeah. But once you have a tattoo, then anything you get dilutes the meaning of all the tattoos a little bit, and then every tattoo becomes slightly less important. I wouldn't say it dilutes the meaning, but it dilutes the scariness. Sure. Yeah. 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 Because uh, my wedding ring is still just as meaningful, despite all the tattoos I've gotten since. I, I should say dilutes the importance of that being your only tattoo. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's a an attrition to to your non tattooedness mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. sure. But you know, definitely always go slow with tattoo choices. They are rather permanent. You you can't go too slow with choosing your first tattoo or any tattoo like i love tattoos i would never pressure anyone to just jump into it with their first like no 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 you take the 10 years you, you do what you got to do and, and it's like for me it's always ha i've had trouble getting a tattoo of something i'm a fan of just because again like people are saying like even star wars tattoos like the the canon and the the feeling around star wars has changed so many times despite it being incredibly popular and then you know getting a tattoo of an obscure series like wheel of time means i'm always going to have to explain what wheel of time is to people which less of an issue than it used to be but um that explanation, I have to explain I was born in Canada. I have to explain. There's other things I have to explain all the time, you know, that uh, I just find that to be annoying. Yeah, lots of people don't like explaining their tattoos or having them commented yeah. on. I'm weird that way. I kind of like my tattoos being conversation starters, which, like, I don't know why. I just, for some reason, that works for me. But uh, most people are like you. I am. I am the minority opinion, for sure. I wouldn't want to talk about my tattoos. And if I don't want to talk about them then I don't want them to be seen. If I don't want them to be seen, why am I getting them in the first place? Yeah, my dad kind of had that reasoning, except he really wanted them. So he has a very thorough covering of tattoos under his like t-shirt and shorts line, like on his back and upper arms and his hips, because he didn't want everyone to, anyone to talk about him. So he just had them only in places that were easy to cover for a very long time. And it was a whole hang-up he had where he really wanted tattoos, but he couldn't stand the thought of people commenting on them. So he just got very densely done on his back and shoulders <laughs> where and i'm the i'm i don't have the first but i do have the second right where i don't really want them i've never had a desire for a tattoo you know and i've seen some cool ones where i'm like that would be cool but then usually the cool factor if i see it again in a couple of years i'm like mm, no it wasn't that cool to begin with you know i like for a while i really like the mechanical uh tattoos oh, people, anyway yeah, i'm yeah, way yeah. off way off tangent yeah that's good weed you're smoking over there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, where were we? What are we doing? I, I told you when we started this, you were going to have to keep me on track because uh, because of the montage and the time jumps in this chapter, it's very it's not a linear chapter. It's a lot of moments. And so it's very I'm, I'm definitely dipping into those moments, not in any sort of uh, chronological order.
Okay, so the next moment that is relevant is the encounter in the kitchen, where she faces down Alvestir. So Egwene goes into the novices' dining halls, thinking about the numbers that she's going to create when the tower gets reunited. And she gets tripped by a novice, because we're having a, a power struggle thing. And Alvestir is just an absolute child. Egwene handles her like putty with, again, her swan skills, right? Because right, Alvestir's right. like, no one's going to say anything if you report me. And Egwene's like, hmm, you want to take the three O's and not lie, but you want others to lie for you. And she just sounds so sage and so wise. And it makes a very strong impression on Alvestir. Alvestir becomes uh, Nicola 2.0 after this because of how this encounter goes down. And by the end of the chapter, we have all the novices standing getting her a tray, getting honey in her tea, bringing her a cushion. That's how the chapter ends. This is the bookend to that. That's the whole point of the chapter is this. She's basically won people over by holding them to a higher standard, which yes. is something Elida has never done, right? Elida is always going to the lowest common denominator, punishment, fear. Whereas Egwene's like, no, I'm just holding you to a higher standard. You can beat me. I'm not really going to tell. But you really expect people to lie for you? That's not cool. You know, and like that's just a really great way of of g going around, just by saying, "Yeah, I, I hold myself, and I hold you to a higher standard." And and by punishing me, you're not hurting me; you're hurting the tower. You're hurting the truth. You're hurting I Sedai. You're hurting yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it wins over people who are just trying to find their way and are not deeply committed to being against her. You know, the novices and accepted are just trying to follow the lead of the I Sedai, like. Well, and they're in this deeply, deeply toxic corporate environment where the toxicity is coming down from the top. And here's someone saying, like, just act better. I'm doing it. Yeah, and it's like, you don't need them to tell you to be better. I can tell you to be better. You can tell you to be better. Yeah, it's institutional toxicity versus just like a grassroots example on the ground doing its thing. And it works really well on the novices. The novices come in clutch for her time and time and time again, all the way up through the battle for the tower against the Shan Shan. Totally. The novices and the accepted are her biggest asset, really. And I love the way the meeting she has with the novices here, the one-on-ones where she starts helping them with their fears and even their channeling really sort of foreshadows her ability to bring them together with Vora Sangriel. And, and teach them how to link and all. It's like they've already been learning from her quite a bit. So it makes sense that then when she needs to teach them how to link, it's very easy for her to do so because she knows these women very well and knows their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. She's got this teacher-student rapport already built up before that highly stressful situation. I hadn't thought about how valuable that is specifically, I, not just the interpersonal rapport, but the teacher-student dynamics specifically. Exactly. Exactly. Because yeah. when we talk about, man, she's t trying to teach them this complicated linking thing that, <laughs> yeah. like, is hard to do. And it's, like, one of the reasons and – and I've been skeptical about that in the past. I've been like, eh, it just seems like she's, you know, able to do that really quick. And now I'm like, okay, well, Jordan actually was sort of setting that up by be by giving her this um, teacher-student relationship with the novices that, were, that existed. <laughs> and also just how few accepted there are in Ooh, the tower. Truly. So few. So few. Yeah. Yeah. Once the last battle is over and everything is organized, the sh they're going to be going through shifts of accepted tests, just like mm -hmm. churning these women out for like months, just like back to back accepted tests as fast as they can take a nap and refresh and get another eyes to die up there to like power the Angriol. Like they're going to have so many women taking the test. The other interesting thing here in the kitchen is the steady stream of eyes to die serving women taking food up to eyes to die quarters. Right. Just how broken the tower is. It's indicative of the social dynamics that Egwene is having a really hard time believing. This is a really helpful piece of evidence for her understanding how deeply these cracks run. She's like, nah, it's not that bad. And again, this is day one. She's still very much in the process of being disabused of her notions about what was going on in the tower. And this stream of cloth covered tray is just heading out constantly because none of the eyes to die want to eat in the common hall is really really indicative of some bad bad things um so then she heads out of the kitchen to classes right and they give her a fork root tea very diluted tiny amount of fork root tea 
to keep her from channeling strongly. I get a little confused about the effects of Fork Root Tea. It seems like uh, if you can channel at all, you can channel pretty well. I don't know. It, it, this whole weak tea makes you able to channel weakly. It seems not right to me. It seems like weak tea should just fade from your system quickly. I mean, he does have her getting dosed every hour, whereas when Nynaeve and Elaine were dosed, it was hours between doses, I think. But yeah, I it does feel like he added a level of detail in kind of a retconny sort of way. Like it was just like a binary, you drink it, you're out. And now he's like, oh, no, there's nuance. There's actually recipes that we've worked out real quick. Sure. Yeah, I mean, a poison, do- dosage makes the poison and all that jazz, right? Like, so, sure, we, we don't really know how it works at low doses, but okay. <laughs> like, it seems like, eh, why don't they just shield her? And this this use of fork root tea, it, it seems like it's a setup for the, so that she can channel a little bit at the last battle and form a circle. At, at right? the battle of the at, tower. Sorry, not the last battle, right. I think of that as, I mean, it's... Part of the last. It's the it's the opener to the headliner. Yeah, like the battle for the tower yeah. is definitely the opener before the main event of the last battle. Right, right, right. I, I it's after the last battle in my mind has started, even though it's a battle kind of happening independently. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, that's super valid. But you know, the whole reason the Sean Chan are there is because uh, Ishamael gave him the sign that says it's time to come back. Right. Like. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. So. You know, in a yes. lot of ways, it is a strike of the dark one. It's just, yeah, I, I'm stretching that. I know. Yes, <laughs> just accept your your loss and move on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's because if they shielded her, shielding is binary. You can't be weakly shielded, right? And he wanted her to be able to weakly channel, so he decided that the T was a way that he could do that. Is what I think really happened. Jordan wanted weekly channeling Egwene, so he invented slash backfilled to make it work. I mean, Lanfear did it to Osmodian. That is so true. But also, that's a level of nuance and sophistication that modernized that I don't have that might really be limited to Age of Legends. But you're right. You're right. Shielding, shielding is not binary in that way. You are right. I am wrong. But certainly the Tower Eyes to Die don't have that skill, as far as I can recall. No, definitely not. Um, so she goes to her first class, and this is one of my favorite little uh, uh, yeah. showing off bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun. <laughs> Where she's like, uh, the teacher's like, okay, since everybody here can do a ball of fire, let's see if the really weak student um, can do it. Right? Basically, she's uh, accepted who's almost a child herself, and so she's trying to one-up Egwene. Well, and she was there when Egwene showed up. She's jealous of how fast Egwene moves. She's just trying to do some pecking order nonsense and assert that she's the better one now. Ha ha ha. But that would only work if Egwene was accepting herself as a novice, which she is not. And so Egwene creates seven balls surrounded by seven rings in each of the Aja colors, right? Again, emphasizing the seven Aja's. Uh right all seven all seven colors right that's an act of defiance also splitting it that many ways right a lot of these accepted can't even split their weaves a lot of the i said i can barely split their weaves right that's something that's considered very difficult to do and it's get exponentially harder with each time you split right some of them are lucky to split two or three times Egwene's doing it 14 Right. And it's just, it's being like, this is an absurd lesson. What could you possibly teach me when I can do this? Right. Also, you know, as you were talking, it occurred to me, not only is she doing the seven Aja colors, she's done two different groups in two different forms, each of the seven colors. Right. She's balancing both towers. She's saying visually, I am bringing together two different groups of the Aes Sedai and I am making them into a harmonious whole somehow in this intricate dance. And the balls in the center, which represent the tower, red is the biggest. And the rings on the outside, which are outside the tower, red is the smallest. And green is the biggest because she would have chosen green if she'd had her choice. Yes. Yeah, it's she's literally just like waving her flag in the middle of class being like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? 
what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And even with Fork Root in her, she's like, even while I am drugged and in prison, I am managing both of these systems and you literally cannot stop me. It's like, hey, listen, I went on the hero's journey. I'm a hero now. Like, yeah. I can yeah. do hero shit. I, like, <laughs> what are you trying to do? I Make me a novice up. again. <laughs> I've leveled the fuck up. This is this is basically when you get stuck back at the beginning of a game after leleling up to level like five, 50 or 100 or whatever. And they're like, you know, all right, go ahead and kill those sewer rats. And you're like, okay. Um, <laughs> right, right. This yeah. is not going to be a challenge. You like explode with power, and they just drop, and you're like, okay, was was that, um, is that what you wanted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it it feels very beginning beginning of the video game again. Yeah, it's a good scene. I like it. And then when she gets yanked out of class to get you know punished by her red Aja handler people, uh, we have an interesting interaction where Katarine the Black Aja, Red Sister. Black Aja, yeah. Black, uh, what is it? She's on the council. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she's like hitting Egwene with the, with air because like, I, I told you to run and Egwene's walking at a measured pace and the other Red grabs her arm and is like, stop. You have to stop. This is not your right. And Katarina's like snapping at her even. It's a very tense interaction between Reds over Egwene. Like, Again, we are day one. Let's be fair. Between a black and a red. Well, again, yes, exactly. Exactly. Like, it's... And that's where that tension comes from, is Katarine was going to beat her like a black. And the red is like, whoa, even I think that's too far. Mm -hmm. And, like, when you've got the red defending Egwene, y y your cover might be getting a little thin, Katarine. <laughs> yeah. Might want to <laughs> dial it back a little bit. Just... Uh... Do we... What's Katarine's ultimate fate? Do you know? Do you remember? No. What? Well, it's Google time. Whee! But don't let Google summarize it because we might be eating glue covered rocks. And we don't want that. <laughs> don't worry. I'm going to Encyclopedia Watt. That's actually okay. uh, a good, human good, good. who's written <laughs> primary everything source. there. Excellent. Primary source. Uh, that would be secondary. Primary source is the books themselves. We'd have to look it up there. Well, the primary source to what Google would summarize, I guess. Is, sure. Is the, sure. The parlance of that model. But yes, truly, the books are the primary source. Oh, uh, Egwene kills Messana, but it turns out it was Katarine in disguise. So Egwene... Uh, during the, the dream battle? Yep. Yeah, Katarine becomes the mistress of novices after uh, Sylviana, after Sylviana gets uh, thrown in prison for disobeying. Katarina becomes mistress of novices briefly. Yeah, but that's like two days before yeah, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the tower collapses, yeah. And she gets, yeah, fireballed by Egwene in the dream. Which is great. Yeah, we just love having a dark friend as Mistress of the Novices. Shirium, Katarine. It's actually, it's shocking that Sylviana is not a dark friend, frankly. And she's enough lawful neutral that I would argue she's borderline dark friend just by sheer procedural alignment. Like, I like her <laughs> because she comes around in the end, kind of. But, mm. like, when you're that bureaucratically aligned with people that are definitely doing Black Aja things, like, ah. <laughs> I don't know, tainted by association. <laughs> there is a certain amount of Sylviana feels a little bit like the middle manager in the Nazi regime of just like, I know you were just punching papers, but I I don't know. It seems like you and you were doing your job great. And, oh, uh, you know, here's a better analogy. The rocket engineers from the Nazi regime. <laughs> who we brought over to this country <laughs> and had work for us and celebrated because their work was so incredibly mm. useful. Yeah. And yet the rockets were also used to, you know, bomb soldiers. and Look, conquering the moon before the communists was not going to do itself. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not going to get preemptively struck. So that's kind of how I feel about Sylviana, where it's like, mm, you really were on the wrong side. You really were supporting the wrong people. You were really kind of doing bad things. You were beating the shit out of this 18-year-old girl until she needed healing twice a day, until she's bloody. Like, that's not an innocent thing to be doing. I get you were just following orders, but at some point, just following orders just doesn't do it for me. And I don't like that Egwene elevates her in the way that she does. I don't understand what Sylviana did besides following orders that gets her, that elevates her into that position. Well, maybe the Nelson Mandela comparison is going to be appropriate then, because we can talk about the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa and how much that was 
pissing off mm, of literally mm-hmm. everybody because he, you know, gave too much to each side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So compromise is complicated, I guess. That <laughs> is true. The very fast true. way to say that. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know if she's necessarily the Von Braun of the entire regime, but yeah, sure. There's, um, yeah, I like her because she does ultimately come around, but it is frustrating how long it takes because she's very bureaucratically aligned with what's happening. Like to deprogram yourself that hard on your own while actively per- perpetrating evil is like, I mean, good on you for getting there eventually. That is Im- an impressive feat. Yeah. Given your context. She grew. I, I guess I should give her room to grow. It's but just, uh, uh, it's- yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the the resistance to giving her accolades and rank and recognition is, is I think, well-grounded. Can I also just say I love this line? Juggling with the power, this is a reference back to her juggling the, the balls and the rings. Juggling with the power is not all that much easier than juggling with your hands. But I'm too glad he acknowledges it must be easier because there's no way to juggle seven rings and seven balls with your hands. Just not possible. No, no, it's it's a comparable mental feat. If the yeah. number of hands is not a limiting factor, right? Like your brain can keep doing that, but the number of hands you have limits it. But with the power, you're using your fingers or nothing at all to do it. So there's less of a limitation. Right. <laughs> Super Sky, like Sylviana seems like the human moral event horizon. If you're doing something wrong and Sylviana says you're doing it wrong, you know you're super wrong. Sure. <laughs> I like it. Uh, so after she runs rings around the accepted, they shift her teaching to one-on-ones with Aes Sedai. Yes, and this is important for two reasons. The main one being her access to Aes Sedai is much more important. And also, it's like her sliding upwards in the hierarchy. Like, she's literally yeah, forcing right. her way up, even within a system she doesn't agree with. They're like, well, we got to treat her at least a little like an accepted, not a novice. Like, eh. Just because she knows too much to be treated like a novice. Like, then the, she's shown that it's silly to treat her like a novice. It's disruptive to the other novices. And what they're trying to do is bury her importance. And if she's going to make right. a fuss everywhere she goes, that's sort of against the point. So they have to find something else to try to diffuse her impact. And can we also talk about how they have zero, zero punishment strategy other than beat her more? I feel... Like, they could have been more creative in 3,000 years? That's what I'm saying, right? Like, I, 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 my mouth can't form words because I'm just like, there's other ways to punish people. There's other ways to induce behavior. There's other things that you can do to somebody other than put them over your knee and strap her. And the fact that that has proven to be ineffective, I, I, I guess this might might be what I have against Sylviana more than anything else. When the beatings prove ineffective, why do you keep doing them? Yeah. Which is, you know, a bigger problem than her. The Mistress of Novices rulebook has one step and then, yeah, you know, so it's like, but that seems weirdly inadequate for an institution yeah. that's had this many women go through it. You'd think that they would understand, like, how to withhold food or induce it, any of the things that Sul don't do to their demani. I mean, like, come on. Like, the Aes Sedai treat their novices basically like servant people without much, you know, free will to do their own thing. Like, you'd think they would have hit on some of the things that Sul don't do just to keep them, like, corralled. But yeah, they've unironically went for beatings will continue until morale approves. Like, they don't realize that that's an ironic statement. They're just doing it. <laughs> right. They're 100% just doing that. Yeah. And yeah, they do have, like, the whole sending people to farms for 20 years or whatever. But yeah, it's weird how they're just... Elida's just really hell-bent on beating Egwene into shape. And it feels like RJ got kind of in a hole creatively like got tunnel vision on like this is how it's gonna go and it's like but in real life wouldn't people be interested in other methods i wouldn't say it's rj got tunnel vision i would say the the i said i have tunnel vision i think he's making a point about that right i think he's saying that these people have no creativity they're stuck in a rut they can only look at things from one side they will keep bashing their heads against a wall that's what makes the tower i said i the tower i said i I just have such a hard time believing that they've survived for 3,000 years with that little innovation. Like, that's just a stretch to me. Yeah, I, 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 and I would bet other mistresses and novices have 
different ways of approaching these women. I mean, I but know. yeah, the the beating is when I the the beatings are supposed to be the last resort, right? And I think that's why they continue because it's like this is supposed to be all, everything else we've tried has failed, and we do beatings, right? But they never tried anything else with Egwene. They went straight to the beatings. And because it's supposed to be the last resort, they have nowhere else to go from there. They started you know, they started at the top, right? And so there's nowhere to go up. Yeah. And that's just... I, much like Adelorna, I wish that Cad Swain was here. Because Cad Swain would think of something more interesting than just more strapping. Sure. Right. She'd make her eat beans off the floor or something. Which I would hate. But at least it would be different. <laughs> So we get a mention of uh, some of the sisters walking through the halls. We get Pavara, who we know is doing the whole um, searching for dark friends quest. Same as Doacine, who she also mentions. Yeah. And so I think a lot of what she's seeing is like she's noticing weird behavior from them because they're hunting the dark friends. Right. And she's noticing that weird behavior. Right. 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 She says she can't ask about the ferrets because she doesn't know. She knows their names, but not their faces. So she doesn't know who to approach about them. And then we talk about Liana. We go visit Liana and see how she's sort of doing, uh, which we get a lot of good scenes with Liana. There's a lot of fun eyes to die chatter in the background every time we visit Liana because she has her guards and they are not reds. They tend to be you know, browns or whites or yellows. and They say interesting things and talk about interesting stuff. And she seems to be making a bit of a difference, right? She's influencing these women a little bit. She's telling them about the outside. She's doing the same thing as Egwene, but people are listening to her a little bit more because, or at least the Aes Sedai are listening to her a little bit more because they accept that she's also Aes Sedai. And they're seeking her out as an interesting novelty and talking to her, yeah, as a colleague. They're like, how? But also I take you seriously. Whereas Egwene is a child. Leanna is at least a woman in their eyes, in their hierarchy. And so Egwene really does have to change things through example, whereas Liana can change things through words a little bit more. And she does a very good job at that because she is really good at people skills. And then she asks Egwene, so when do we escape? Egwene says, we don't. We take it down from the inside. And Leanna just basically cracks her knuckles and says, all right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like, I've basically been doing that already, you know? <laughs> like, She's like, oh, so continue doing what I've been doing. All right, cool, cool. Uh-huh, uh-huh. She's like, so we're we're following Swan's playbook that I've been following, right? Like, but that's literally, just, yeah. she's like, okay, so Swan has changed in face, but not in mode. Okay, no, yeah, got it. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm like, why does everything uh, Liana do fall so in line? It's like, oh, it's just Swan's playbook. They're both following it. Mm-hmm. So the next thing I've got is Benai Nalsad, the brown that gets in trouble. <laughs> so now we have a series of Aes Sedai where she's visiting one after the other after the other. And we get it again. We're in serious montage uh, mode. But there's little facts about each of these Aes Sedai to talk about. Yeah. Over the course of all these beatings, we are also having these encounters with Aes Sedai, which we now get to run through back to back without beatings interspersed, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, I love the parallel to the owl in Varen's yeah. study. There's a large brown lizard was perched on a huge skull of a bear, so you'd have thought it was stuffed until it blinked. I'm assuming for the same reason that it eats mice who chew paper. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, lizards? Some lizards eat mice. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Desert ecology is brutal, man. Yeah. All right. I yeah. You know, I realize I know very little about uh reptiles. Definitely not my area where I'm like uh much of an expert. Yeah, I've I've just seen enough nature documentaries with a lizard uh mouse's hindquarters going down a reptile's gullet. Yeah. It's like, no, that true. happens. That's I've, true. I've, I've I've heard David Attenborough tell me that it happens. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I guess I have too, but for some reason I never remember the da David Attenborough documentaries that well. Must be in some odd state of mind when I'm watching them. Hmm. <clears throat> But no, I love myself some David Attenborough. Oh, and according to Margot, even bearded dragons uh, sometimes get small mice, like pet bearded dragons. And I guess snakes, I've seen snakes eat mice, right? Like those are, you know, yeah. so that's yeah. that's pretty standard fare. Yeah, you can just buy rats and mice for your for mm -hmm. your pet reptiles. Mm -hmm. So yeah, totally. Um, I love Benai in general because, well, first of all, she's brown. 
so obviously she's great but Duh. i love how Egwene just like pied pipers her into so much trouble and then <laughs> gets her yes. out of it again and thus gets a stalwart ally for life it's just so amazing i love the interaction right because this is oh i guess i shouldn't have told you that but i shouldn't have told you that i shouldn't have told you that mm, guess you're gonna have to go do some digging mm. <laughs> i'm like Egwene, the a steel trap mind just forgot that she shouldn't mention that. Okay. Okay. So you know why I think she did it, right? So Ben A is saying, okay, you know, make a ball of fire. Okay. Make this weave. Okay. Make that wave. Okay. Make the weave for traveling. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, and Egwene's like, come on, you're not going to get me with a game of Simon says, that, right. Right, I'm not going to show you the weave for traveling by accident, or especially after Leanne warned me. And then immediately she turns around and is like, well, you know, I'm going to get you in some trouble. <laughs> like, I, I think that's honestly why she did it. I think it was like, oh, you're going to you're gonna play games with me? You're going to try and get me in a game of Simon Says? I'm going to tell you something that's going to ruin your fucking career. But maybe I'll also save your career later. And, well, that's and later. Then, yeah, then yeah, you'll yeah, be yeah. my bestie. It'll be great. No, it's... I love it. And also then we get, you know, more information about the 13th Depository. And of course, we all love secrets. So that's fun. And this is the one later where she comes to Egwene and says, I got in trouble. Well, somebody got in trouble. Hypothetically, if someone got in trouble. <laughs> what do I do? And Egwene says, well, you could tell them where the information came from so they can stop thinking there's a leak. And then you can volunteer to be one of the librarians who takes care of the 13 depository. And thus your career can skyrocket. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah. And then and then all of a sudden you get to be one of these special secret Browns that, you know, has access to special information and, you know. You're on all the secret email chains and the, the text messages that everybody's been hiding from right. you. Right. Yeah. And it works out great for her. But yeah, it's a fun interaction. And then after that. There's also the little, the, the history lesson about Sheen. Oh, yeah. Sheen Chunla. And then how she was basically controlled by the hall and how that's a bad idea. You actually need a single leader. Especially in times of war. Right, yeah. Gwen uses it to be like, you know, if you really don't like the way the tower's being run, there is historical precedent for just changing it. Mm -hmm. Six times in the history of the tower when the Amberlin was dangerously divisive or dangerously incompetent and the hall failed to act, sisters have risen up to remove her. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. She could not have planted the seed deeper with a shovel or driven it home more bluntly with a hammer. <laughs> it is quite blunt. But this is a brown sister we're talking about, so she does need it spelled out rather directly. I, I think it is a good point here, though, that she hasn't heard of the other two wars the woman brings up. She did miss a lot of novice and accepted classes on history, etiquette. And, and Swan did a lot to make up for that in private lessons. But, you know, you can't make up for years of teaching, years of school in six months of private tutoring. Yeah, it's just not possible. Swan had to pick and choose so specifically that, yeah, Egwene is like, you're going to take a century or so to, to backfill what she should have known before chaining this position. That's that's a real criticism. That, and I like how she owns it. Like, no, yeah, I am 18. That is that is true. I'm the Omerlin and I'm 18. Both things can be true. The next Aes Sedai we encounter is Lyrell... Lyreen. Doraline? Lyreen Dorellen? Lyreen Dorellen. Yeah, and this is where Egwene gets casually informed that Elida tried to kidnap Rand. She's literally never heard of the kidnapping plot until it just gets dropped in casual conversation here. Which is very, like, whoa. Yeah, even though you know a bunch of stuff, you also are still books behind. That's kind of a trip. Information takes a while to travel. It's one of Jordan's founding thesis for this novel. It, it it really is when you listen to him talk in that in that prologue, you realize that like information takes time to travel and it changes over both time and distance. And like how much how important that was to almost every scene that he's writing. And then and then I, I say how much I think that ties into his really good POV work, right? Because in order to you to have information change over time and distance, you really have to look at one person's POV and how are they seeing the information versus how this person sees the information. And I wonder how much, because I don't see the same POV work in some of his earlier stuff. It's not quite as good. He developed it over time, for sure. 
And I, and I really do think to, to really hammer in that one point of information changes over time. Yeah. Yeah. He had to develop his craft better so that he could make his point more thoroughly. That's, that's good art. <laughs> and then she has a not so great encounter with Pratala Nirbhajan, who is um, antagonistic. We sort of get a switch. We get all the good interactions in the beginning and then all the sort of negative or antagonistic ones at the end, right? So she has a series of successes and then a series of failures. Yeah. And this one, basically, she gets punished for pointing out that Elida's power effectively has no limits unless the Aes Sedai say that there are limits. And this is apparently a spanking offense. And, and what she's doing is laying out her argument one line at a time to various, basically planting the arguments one line at a time to various Aes Sedai, knowing they're going to go argue with each other and they'll hear the arguments, bring them up, and hopefully there'll be a whole coherent argument put together from all of her various points that, and all the seeds that she's planting among all these Aes Sedai, even the ones who punish her. And then when she addresses them in a body, she'll be able to reference things all of them have heard from her individually as she goes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Her next bad encounter is Sarancha Colvine, who spends more of her time writing out a list of what Egwene did wrong than actually teaching her. That feels just like a super petty power play. It doesn't even have anything to do with Egwene, <laughs> like, particularly. It's just how this woman is. And then she like has to carry the list back to Sylviana and get beaten for all of them. I wonder what Sylviana does with that. It's like, uh, this one's for those three offenses. This I know, one's for right? those three. Like, how do you like, tally that? Like, yeah. And then there's Ada Lorna, who is the captain general of the Green Aja and is one of the first people to really. Well, she interacts with Egwene during the battle of the tower. She gets rescued. She's on the first floor, right? Yeah, Egwene rescues her. Um, and then later, yeah, when she's at high command down in the lower floors and realizes that it is Egwene who's, you know, doing the resistance. And she's one of the first people who says, oh, well, maybe we should accept Egwene as our leader for the post Elida world because sure seems like she's the only one we all like. <laughs> she, We get a lot of POV from her during the post Elida pre-unification window. That's Adelorna's really our main POV for that transition. I really love the moment here where after beating Egwene, she frowns her hairbrush like it's not working. Like it's like something wrong with I it. Know. She's like, oh, yeah. fuck? like, is this not? She's like, I've hit lots of students with this and it always has a different effect. Yeah. Like, uh, it, it, is defective hairbrush? What's going on? Like, did you switch it out for a soft padded one? Is that why you're like, yeah, it, it's, it's, that's that moment really just made me laugh having her just like look down at brush and be like what right, <laughs> be like, right. i don't know yeah. it really 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 tickled my funny bone that's good and also she's green which is the odd that a would have come yeah. from so there's definitely always that extra layer of anytime she interacts with the green it's like yeah. this could have been your aja colleague if only the timeline had been different and right after she looks at the brush is when she says i wish god swain was here right she would teach you a lesson Another yeah green. also yeah. like yeah. she would figure out why this brush isn't <laughs> working <laughs> yeah cat swain would know how to make this brush work properly <laughs> That's what she's thinking. Definitely. Um, this is where she thinks about the, the pain as a badge of honor. That's the battle that she's fighting. This is how she's able to sort of give into the pain, accept the pain, is realizing, like, the pain is minor compared to the pain of losing the battle right, which that she's fighting. It's weird mental gymnastics to me, but hey, whatever gets her through, I'm in support of. Yeah, I mean, it. it, it but I, I do want to say something about how mental pain can be worse than physical oh, pain. For real. I mean, you yeah. talk about people who hurt themselves, like, I mean, we can talk about cutting, we can talk about people who burn themselves alive, we can talk about suicide, all of those things are, are instances where people are hurting themselves physically because they are in so much mental anguish that the only relief from the mental anguish is physical pain. Yeah, which I can relate to to some extent because I've learned recently that when I'm really dysregulated, painfully loud music can bring me back into round. Like I turn music on really loud and at some point it becomes painful, but it wasn't before. Like it's like I get regulated and then once I get a certain amount of regulated, then it I realize that it hurts and then I can turn it down and like, oh, OK, I'm feeling calmer now. Like so I totally get it. I just much like with Rand, I'm deeply impressed at the scale that Egwene can take it to. Uh, for me, it's picking. I'll, I'll, if I've got, if I realize that if I have a lot of anxiety, especially at work, I will find some bump on my skin and pick at it till I bleed until it hurts. 
uh, and then I'll keep picking at it till it hurts more, until it bleeds more. And I'm not doing it consciously. I won't even realize I'm doing it. So I'll be like, are you okay? And I'll be like, oh, 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 I, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, RE tattoos and clenching my jaw yeah. and digging my nails into my sure, hands. I right. mean, you know, it, right. it, so on and so forth. Yes. So there, there is a level of like, I get it, like pain on, on one level, physical pain does pale in comparison to mental anguish. Yes, but Egwene is, is her mental anguish is this very like lofty intellectual, like, but the tower and my place in the political world of saving everything. It's not like mental health. It's like her belief system. And that surprises me. Well, OK, but let, let's get into Egwene's head a little bit. This is someone who was abused by the Sean Chan and then elevate, you know, brainwashed by the the wise women into all sorts of things, and then elevated into what can be considered the most powerful position in the world, all within the course of two years of being pulled out of her rural town. She has so much pressure on her to make this work, to be amazing. That's really valid. The amount of pressure she is feeling is nothing compared to pressure, anxiety that we felt at work or in school. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a like, lot. It's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot, lot. She's when she's, we look at what Rand's gone through, you look at what she's gone through, you know, they're very comparable on a lot of levels. Um, the timing might be different, but, you know, we don't, we don't wonder why he's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's been through through some stuff that, yeah. No, I mean, that's that's super valid. Her worldview, all of the suffering she's experienced in her life kind of depends on things going a certain way at this point. So, yeah, I guess that mental anguish is more than just ideological. It's kind of how she's holding her sanity together also. There's no LTT for her. She's just got to be a badass. Just whatever thing in her brain says she has to prove herself better than everybody else around her. Yeah, which yeah, none, none of us can relate to at all. <laughs> what? No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We get a little bit about the novices here and sort of their behavior. Nicola and Arena uh, basically tell a bunch of exaggerated tales. Again, tales distorting over time and distance about Egwene. That's Timber, if you can hear him grunting on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I heard that. <laughs> the big old dog stretch. Yeah, the boy. Um, and then a bunch of the novices try and act like her. They're like, oh, if she can get away with it, so can we. And they get their asses beat and they go, I don't want to do that anymore. That was not fun. Because they don't have the same mental anguish, the same goals, the same guilt the same responsibilities piled onto them that Egwene does yeah, they don't have the same conviction that they should be in charge of things because of course they shouldn't be it's silly uh whereas Egwene is very convinced that she's right you know all the rest are trying to emulate her but we can't have a hall full of Omerlins. we only need one Omerlin, you know so it makes sense that they can't emulate her timber definitely disagrees with you I, wow <laughs> <laughs> you can hear him making noise of objection yeah. there. He's very opinionated. Very, very opinionated. I'll just take a bond while we're uh, waiting for him to get his, <laughs> just gonna take get a his opinions out. Don't worry, I'll leave all the dog noises for the recording. People love dog noises. And he wants out. <laughs> him clawing at the door. Let's see. Can you see that? Mike. Look, there is Mike. You're okay. You can stay in here for a little bit longer. Meanwhile, I was at a 80-year-old's birthday party uh, over the weekend and ran into someone randomly there at the keg because, you know, that awkward thing where you're both heading to the keg and you've got to figure out who's going to go first. So we ended up striking up a conversation. Within three sentences, I had mentioned that I do a podcast. C- completely without meaning to it's just so on the brain constantly and of course this person has only watched the show wheel of time but it's like oh i'll totally you, follow you it's a five star i'm just like you, you won't because we're drinking black beauty porn no. but like, right 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 it was also very funny that i said wheel of time and he's like oh yeah no i i watched the show it's great <laughs> so that was fun i love people like i'll follow you and give you a five star and i'm like that's not i don't really need that i'd rather you just like actually if you list want to listen listen if you don't yeah it's fine. like 
you won't remember and also I, I need to remember to carry the stickers with me because then i could at least give people like a reason to remember but it's like you're not gonna remember you're barely gonna remember that you struck up a conversation with me you're certainly not going to remember the name of my podcast yeah like you didn't type it into your phone or something yeah yeah Ooh, this chapter it, it's a long chapter too like it's a big, it's a honking, big chapter. honking chapter the, the page count is, is high. high yeah and that's that's why we need this the chapter's high. high. <laughs> so yeah, and this chap, this chunk with the novices is also where she's helping one at a time. She's not holding classes. She's not going to teach more than one at a time. But she is creating one-on-one relationships with these girls, helping them with, you know, whatever they're having trouble with in class, whether it's a, a subject material, right? Because I, I kind of think of her as someone who like went through grad school yeah, totally, right totally. and is to back in high school and people are like how do i do calculus and she's like well i've been using calculus for like a year now on a on a daily basis so let me show you because this stuff is really simple and then just that combined with comforting them because of the last battle stuff right because this is where she gets clued into the fact that corridors change she didn't know that yeah. because she was out in the camp and camps are apparently not being affected but here she is in the first few days over the course of the first week get clued into the fact that sometimes the corridors move and there's ghosts walking in and out of walls and none of the Aes Sedai are addressing it but everyone knows it's happening right Right. Which is kind of what happened in Camelin, except for Elaine was also worried that she was had pregnancy brain. Right, right. But uh But same thing. And yeah. she's and Egwene's able to talk it over with Swan and, you know, make sure that she's, you know, got the definitely Eyes to Die approved explanation to hand out. And it it does just like with Elaine being like, Well, I don't know why this is comforting to Dylan, but I guess it is. Same thing with Egwene. She, it feels like feeble comfort, but the fact that these women are able to say their fears out loud and be heard and have their feelings validated is enough to diffuse the anxiety. It's literally all you have to do is say, I hear you. You're not crazy. Your feelings are valid. And like... That's half the battle, even if you can't do anything about the building itself. Also, her her being like, yeah, the last battle's coming. Did you think the White Tower wouldn't be affected? Like, the White Tower is where it's going to happen. Like, we are... Well, she doesn't exactly say that, though. No, 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 no. She, she leaves out the last battle part. She's just like, it's just White Tower shit. You know? Vaguely. She's like, in her mind, she's like, it's the pattern unraveling, but I'm going to... I'm going to fuzz that over. We'll just... Skip that. There are wonders in the world. And is it any wonder they don't appear at the White Tower? Yeah, wonders. You mean bubbles of evil? Like what? (laughs) Shifting realities? Yeah. They're surprising. The rules of physics are bending and that is a miracle. Maybe not a miracle for the good guys, but it's a miracle nonetheless. And then we get to hear what her advice sounds like coming parroted from Nicola. Which just makes Egwene sound like the most insufferable, difficult to like person. The way Nicola <laughs> describes Egwene is just like, I do not want to know this person. It's the same way that the um, the Andorans think the Kyrians make their thrones. Yeah, the cultural mismatch. It's, it's a little the same because it's like, on the one hand, yes, this is what Egwene says. But on the other hand, it's such a simplistic reduction of how Egwene approaches things. Also, I just, I'm I'm in my people should take more breaks and give themselves more rest and space era. And so I don't appreciate work hard, then work harder. Like, no, work hard, then take a nap. Then take a rest day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Tend to yourself. It is important to rest. Yeah, it is important to, to have a chance to recover. Like, you're not going to do your best work if you're just wearing yourself thin day after day after day. And in Gwei's entire arc is that. Like, the... The reason Egwene burns out literally into a flaming crystal at the end is not just Gawain's fault. It's also because she's been running herself at 200% for the past, like, six months up until that point. I mean, you might want to, you may say two and a half years up truly, to that point, right? Like, truly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, she does not rest. So, of course, her advice includes no rest. But don't listen to Egwene. I, look, I love Egwene. It's not in this section, but it's in the next montage chapter of hers uh, where she thinks about she just has to scrub the floor in front of her. Like, I admire so much about Egwene in this arc. She is who I aspire to be in so many ways. But work hard, then work harder, I feel like is a level of, of taking it slightly too far. Just just, dial, just, just work hard and, and then rest. 
And next, what do we have? Laris is the next thing that I have. Okay, Laris. Which she seems to not be punishing Egwene, right? She's like, yeah, go ahead and scrub, but like, if you take a break, go ahead and take a break. And Egwene's reading into that that she's an ally. I'm not so sure how accurate that is and if that ever comes up again. It does. Laris does offer Egwene escape later. I feel like at this point, Laris is holding her judgment. She doesn't know if she wants to accept Elida's orders to treat this one as a novice. She hasn't made up her mind where her allegiance lies yet, I don't think. Given that she helped Swan and Liana to escape, given that she protested to Swan about how the Supergirls were getting treated way back in Dragon Reborn, I feel like she's very much making her own choice regardless of what the Amarlin says about this woman who claims to be the Amarlin, and she just decides to kind of leave Egwene alone. Be like, no, you you seem to be willing to play by the rules as I set them, so I'm not going to play power games with you, because I don't need to. I'm mistress of the kitchens. What are you going to do? Take away my spoon? Like, there's no... Laris is not threatened by Egwene. It's really all the same to her, and Egwene is fine, so she doesn't have to hit beat her and and do all this other shit that the Aes Sedai do and then literally later she does offer escape I wonder how much of this is because remember how um Suan made her mistress of the kitchens an official title yeah and like that she kind of did it just to cover up a visit to Egwene but like naive but yeah naive right it was all the super Uh, yeah it was all the super girls yeah um and I wonder how much of Laris's uh loyalty is because of that you know you know and that like accident to veer and like granting her Uh that little title then led to the escape led to her helping Egwene here like how much of her loyalty and help was because of that little offhanded promotion and her being like you know what she was a good armalin she did promote me treat the staff well it's amazing the little things they'll do for you down the line and that's a point Jordan makes over and over and over again, right? Like, treat your staff mm-hmm. well. He sure does. Like, be, be nice to your waitress. He sure does. Definitely be nice to back of house, too. Not just front of house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just don't interact. You know, ignore back of house. That's all they want. Please. Well, in this case, it's an institution. <laughs> they can't really ignore back of house because they're ah, like gotcha. a department within said <laughs> institution. But yes, yes. As a, as a customer, leave back of house alone. Don't don't walk up to the window. The window is not there for you to talk to the kitchen. Mm 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 mm. It's there for the food to go through, not your face. The food is for your face. It's not the same thing. And you know why the back house makes food for your face? So you won't talk to them, and you'll be shoving too busy shoving food into it. Uh, Egwene thinks of doing all of these chores, both the kitchen and like outside chores, lawn care, all of that stuff. She thinks of it as penance for not having shielded her hidden her ability to channel before doing the Quendiar thing. She's like, yeah, this sucks, but I do kind of deserve it because I, I could have been more clever about my attack. So I'll just accept this as a personal penance and not make a fuss about it. And I'm like, way to pick your battles, Egwene. <laughs> yep, I'll learn this lesson. We get that there are 31 accepted uh, in the tower. 31, that's so few. I could name 31 S named Aes Sedai without even thinking about it. That's so few. I could. Uh, Actually, I'd like to see you try. I don't think you get to 31. 31. A a dozen, sure. Maybe maybe even 20. Yeah, but uh, going up to to 31, I don't think so. Yeah. What if S named people? Yes. 31 S named people, no problem. But yeah. Within I said I, that might be it. Do I count? No, no. Within the books, S oh, named people. Okay. But just if we expand beyond I said I to the entire cast, I never realized I was also S named. God damn it! I fall. <laughs> <in> the... <laughs> Sran, Smat, Sparen. Sparen. Oh my god! No. Sparen. No. <laughs> Seguin. No, we're just we're... It's fail. No, all of you stop. <laughs> Slan. Are are you ready to be serious? (laughs) Slan fear? No! (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I can be serious for a second. Good lord. Chat is in full rebellion. 
Sverin. <laughs> <laughs> You've got anarchy in chat right now. The other thing that's interesting here is she picks up a bunch of random news from being seen as a piece of furniture while Aes Sedai talk. And the important thing of all that is we're rehashing books and books and books and books. And one name, one name comes up again and again. Elida de Avrinia Royhan. Egwene is learning that she has basically nothing to do. And Elida will topple herself because she, literally like what everything's her fault and everyone knows it. Yeah. And, and the list of, you know, the expedition against the Black Tower failed. Uh, Dumai's Wells failed. You know, Sherian being stripped. Shimarin. Shimarin. Hmm. Yeah. Garbage rotting in the streets. Her edict regarding Rand, right? Like, all that stuff. All that stuff was just bad. And, yeah, it's all Elida's fault. And this is where I get frustrated. Because after all of that, we get this line. On the morning of the second day. So you're telling me all of this happened within no, one day. No, no. It's, no, it's just no. weird timeline stuff. It's just weird timeliney, wimey. He's describing a whole series of days and then jumping around to specific events that happened on day two. Yeah, it's it's the road trip chapter, but like with a good reason. <laughs> I would say I I would have if I was editing this chapter together personally, I would have put it more in chronological order, like beating encounter, beating encounter, beating encounter actually like just giving you a sense of the rhythm of her days that's probably how i would have organized this if i was in the editor's seat it's an interesting decision to to organize it the way it is but i can see how that might have felt very repetitive be like oh this is happening and then a beating and this is happening and then a beating it is repetitive that's what she's going through that would be good pov well writing. true but he's trying to cluster. I think he's trying to eliminate the repetitiveness of it by clustering. Like, here's all the good encounters she had with Aes Sedai. Here's all the bad counters. Here's the things from doing chores. Like, well, I think he's a coward. I'm gonna have to disagree with you on that one. <laughs> no, I just. It's weird to me that he's done that sort of pacing thing so many times, making things seem boring or drawn out because that's how the character feels. And this time he decided not to. Like, I guess he just wanted to change it up and do something different. But I expected something more typical and I did not get it. So she's out doing yard work and Aviaran shows up and is like, escape, escape, escape. You want an escape, right? Escape? Escape's a thing. You could find it if you want. Escape. And Egwene's just like, I am content with my situation. And goes, you're not very loyal to Elida, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and all of you, I was like, why would you say that? I was like, mm, I mean, I have eyes. Because, because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doesn't take a politically astute person to notice that you got, you know, fired from being keeper, which is not really a thing. And so every two or three days, she pops up and says, hey, do you want to escape? And Egwene replies, I am content with my situation. Which I feel like is the punchline of some joke where, like... Right? Some really dry humor. Yeah, it's like some I would prefer not to sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little, little Bartleby yeah. going on. Oh, God. Yeah. That movie fucked me up. Not gonna lie. On the fourth day... Now, even though we went from the second day to the fourth day, we somehow have in every two or three days with Alviarin. So don't don't get me started on that. Because I already talked about it. You've already been started on that. She sees Martin Stepaneos, who's been kidnapped by Elida. And has been here for like a week or more at this point. He's been around for a little bit. But he's been on the road in custody for a long time. Yes, he's only recently arrived at the tower within like the last week or more. And he is like, I would like to talk to someone who is not a red sister. Also, she's sort of notorious and Dragon Reborn connection. And you, I just, I need refreshing conversation, please. And Egwene gets to have a very interesting exchange with him. I love the little, like, they hand her a teacup. She drinks it and hands it back. And he's like, oh, they serve you? That seems odd for a prisoner. And she's like, mm, they think a tea will improve my mood. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good euphemism. Because it's not a lie. I mean, really. It's, it's a very... 
very euphemistic way of saying they're poisoning me to keep me magically shackled. And Matt and Stepanaeus was the king of not Erodomon, but Ilion. Ilion. Yes. As, he's as, the dooby dooby doo. Yeah, he says, uh, what be pleasant do be talking to someone other than I said I. So we get a little bit of Baeldomon origin. Uh, king of King of ba- Baeldomon is how I think of Matt and Stepanaeus. Yes. Baeldomon if he was a king. Which is insulting to Baeldomon, but you know, we, we do what we gotta do for our mnemonics. He spouts a bunch of bullshit that's basically been fed to him through half-truths and uh, lies by... Misinformation that he's put together in a predictable way, and the Red Sister's sitting off to the side, like, nodding at him like he's a boy reciting his lessons as he just spouts propaganda. And it's Basically, him, him and Gawain are believe basically the same thing. Basically, yeah, but Matt and Stepaneos is able to have that bubble burst by really gentle questioning, whereas Gawain bursts everyone else's bubble defensively whenever anyone questions him in the slightest. But yeah, Egwene is able to say point for point, you're wrong, you've been lied to, you don't know what you're talking about, and it would be much... it. It would be very. Po- it is very possible for you to verify all of this if you can get any access to information, and if you can't get access to information... Maybe that's a problem you should think about. You know, it's one of those uh, be aware of who you can't criticize kind of moments. It's like, well, the Red Aja doesn't want you to know this and they keep you from learning if I'm telling you the truth or not. You should uh, maybe not be so loyal to them. And you ever wonder why you only see Red Sisters? They're not letting you talk to anybody else. Maybe because they're hiding things from you. Maybe because you've been brought aboard a sinking ship, which I love the ship analogy for... uh, as someone described him, the pa- the pirate king, uh-huh, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Also, with you know, you know, she's doing her best swan impression. She's not quite to the fish metaphor, but she got a boat metaphor in, so you know, she's getting there. She's trying. <laughs> <laughs> I I do think you know, Ilian really. Uh, I I like it. <coughs> excuse me, as the pirate capital, right? Because it's this delta that you can have a bunch of hidden coves and stuff like that, right? And then people can raid from there. So you really can't control who's coming and going. So I, I like it as sort of the pirate, i.e. the pirate king. Sure, we'll take it. It's not at all what's happening, but we'll take it. It's fine. Yeah, so she gets sent off to get beaten again for having the impudence to talk to the king, which gets her in trouble for being late to her next lesson, which gets her beaten again. It's just this, you know, we'll just keep beating her until we run out of hours in the day. And Egwene's just like, all right, fine. I guess dissociating is what I do at this point. And... Then on the seventh day, she rested. No, she didn't. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) She accused Bannon of betraying her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of you will betray me. Yeah, different book, but sure. Is it me, Bannon? (laughs) Yeah, and she, she, yeah, she sees Bannon, goes, you betrayed me. And then she leaps to the conclusion, you must be a dark friend, to which Bannon, you know, hustles her aside and is like, no, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then catches herself in, she tries to lie, you know, essentially about the fair. It's like, I have betrayed And cuts herself off, which proves to Egwene incontrovertibly, all right, so you're not a dark friend because you can't lie. You're still bound by the oath, so I guess I can trust you. But also, you ambitious little snake. How dare? How dare? And, like, she's trying to weasel out of it, and Egwene has to just, like you said, be better and lead by example and be like, no, you are going to warn the fair. It's no matter the risk to yourself. It's a penance for being a little shithead. And Bannon actually accepts. This woman split hairs with a razor. She took the thinnest excuse to decide her oath no longer applied, and then she betrayed the very woman she had helped choose. Yeah, it, I don't yeah. like that about mental Bayern. gymnastics. We, we were really all like confusedly liking her when we saw her before, and this, this, I mean, ah, man, that's that's real shady, Bannon. That's real shady, real shady. I don't like. I don't, like th- we were liking her last time. We were understanding her reasoning while hating where she ended up. It was this like really weird journey where we were like, we kind of like her, but we also hate everything she does. How can we like the person and hate the actions? Like, what is going on? It was a whole journey that we went on. I forget which episode it was, but it happened. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, like Wayne basically begins to win her back over. And at one point, Bannon says, like, it would be so great to see Elida get pulled down. And Egwene's like... That makes no sense. I thought you wanted Elida to get pulled out. She needs the end to spell it out for her and explain what must have happened. 
Well, uh, it wasn't also until Bannon came back and experienced what Elida really was like. And she's like, oh, this was a mistake. Like, I didn't realize how bad things had gotten while we were gone. Exactly. And she, you know, she goes to Leon and she's like, I'm tired and I'm missing something. And Leon is just like, nah, it's Bannon's ambition. I, I, I can do the math and put together the dots and figure out what must have happened. And we know as readers, yeah, Leanna's absolutely correct in her read. And I love her comparing like smiling at Bannon and forgiving her is so much harder than smiling after being beaten. Yeah. Again, like you said, the mental anguish is really a powerful driving factor with Egwene because her emotional response to Bannon is like so much stronger than her reaction to pain. Then we're back to visiting Leanne again. Another visit to Leanne. Yes, with another lovely, bizarre Aes Sedai conversation in the back. This is a real fun one. I mean, this is techno babble to the <laughs> highest degree. This means nothing. Dissimulated structures are fundamental to any possibility of understanding what is happening right now. Like, what? It's so, like... The tachyon beam. Yeah. <laughs> the inherent impossibility of dissimulated structures is a given. A given. Oh, sorry. I did not realize that the inherent impossibility is a given of dissimilar, dissimulated structures, right? And what they're talking about is the, the hallway is yeah, moving, yeah. right? And they're saying, basically, somehow these structures are switching in a way that should be impossible and the other one's saying okay but they're switching so you have to admit that that's reality and the other one's like but it's not logical and like yeah typical white going around in circles and it's a really important like you know under the techno babble what he's there's this line that i think is actually really uh important only a novice would think the real world can be applied to logic ideals must be first principles <laughs> not the mundane world and that is just such yeah. a flawed yeah. way of line. thinking Ooh. like that will yeah. lead you into yeah. the weirdest fucking fascist corners if you think like that you will end up in so many bad places mm -mm. i actually read it the other way but because i was like oh no of course you can't just the real world has to apply to logic right that's that's what physics is right it's like Right. You can get all sorts of weird mathematical structures, but until you have some sort of verification that that's how the real world works, you can't make predictions about the real world with that math. Yeah. And it's like, if you're like models are wrong, right? Models are lies. That is that is axiomic to to all logic is that models are wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's why every teacher you've ever had in physics has lied to you. Exactly. Because the model is wrong. So if you have a model for how you think the world should work and it doesn't match your observed reality, the only rational response is to update your model. People who insist that reality is wrong inevitably end up on the wrong side of history or at least the bad side of science. And, and, and that's the problem with the white's logic, right? Is logic can take you to legitimate places, assuming your assumptions are correct and assuming you apply it to the real world in a way that there's feedback. And they're doing neither of those things. No, and it's a really weird failing of how RJ wrote the white odd. They shouldn't, again, like with the beatings will continue until morale improves. It's like the whites shouldn't be this deluded about the thing that is ostensibly their central tenant. Right, but but again, he's writing every Aja to be deluded about the thing that is yeah. their central tenant, right? Like, that's the whole point of them. He's writing that deliberately, yeah. right? Like, they are they are logic without common sense. Yeah, yeah. Right? That You, you could frame that, right? Like, every Aja is the blues fight a cause without considering the consequences. The greens fight battle without being good at fighting. The, you know, the, the yellow heal on a conceptual level without actually going out and healing people, right? Like, and the whites do logic that sort of just takes their feelings and dresses them up as facts. Right, without ever applying feedback from the real world or considering whether the, the logical conclusions they come to are realistic. Yeah, and they're more devoted to their system than they are to the results. They would rather be appear to be right than actually be advancing their own understanding of reality. 
But I, I get especially angry at the whites because they should be scientists. They should be forming hypotheses and testing be. them. And they're not doing so that. So they're arguing yeah. about if it's possible for what is objectively happening to happen. And it's like, but it happened. It objectively happened. Like I'm watching the series about Chernobyl because I just decided that that would be fun. And they get some stuff wrong, but like, it's fine. It's a drama. And like one of the things they keep circling around is, but it can't have exploded. It's just, it's not possible. And it's like, but it objectively did. And you are killing people by denying that it happened and worrying about the how later. Worry about the how later. The how's not important right now. There's an exposed burning core. Clearly you missed something. Clearly. Right? Like, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter what you think is possible. What matters is what's happening. So yeah, we uh, are with Liana hearing all of that going on in the background. <laughs> Egwene asks Liana, do the sisters who visit you still ask the same questions? Those questions are for the secret of traveling, for basically saying, hey, do they know how to travel? And if they don't, that means Bayonin hasn't passed those things on. And therefore, we can trust her. However, <laughs> however, the reason they're still asking about it is not because Bayonin didn't pass them on. It's because Elida is keeping them close to the breast. And doesn't want to teach very many people because she's a power hungry little. Mm. So this trust of Bannon, not so it's it's almost the wrong to trust her for that reason. They come to faulty conclusions with the facts that are available. They read her correctly, but they just assume that if she had betrayed stuff to Elida, that Elida would have. Because, again, they assume Elida's a better leader than she is. They assume that Elida would spread that information as widely as she could rather than deny her people access to these tools. Sometimes the hardest games I play, like in chess or against amateurs who just they're so bad that you expect them to do the right thing. And they're like, well, that you would never do that. That's dumb. And then it puts you in this weird, awkward position where you're like, uh, okay, well, I have an advantage now, but this is not at all the game I expected to be playing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, they do win Bayonin over in the end. It ends up being, it ultimately becomes the correct trust. It just starts out under false pretenses. <laughs> All right, so then Egwene gets to meet Doacine on the ninth day. And Doacine basically seems to be on her side. She's like, you don't mean to surrender, do you? All right, cool, cool, cool. Which is uh, interesting. And she heals Egwene using the old method. So again, that's more proof, in quotes, that uh, they were not betrayed fully, even though they were. And then after her morning beating, she talks to Sylviana about... How Shamarin was able to be demoted. Because this is a really critical through line to understanding both why Elida is a bad leader and why Egwene is winning this contest of wills. It's all about who's accepting whose authority. Shamarin accepted her demotion and that made it real. Gave it power. And it's also Airbud rules, right? It is also Airbud rules, yes. <laughs> Where Egwene basically says, there's no provision saying she's allowed to demote people. And Sylviana says, there's no provision saying she can't. Which is exactly why Airbud is able to play in the stupid mm -hmm. game, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in that yeah. movie, they say, well, there's nothing saying he can't play in the game okay so airbud rules we have to explain this for anyone who doesn't know airbud rules airbud rules is the dog is allowed to play in the game because he's the mascot and he's clever and everyone's like super into it because it's a feel-good kids movie and then they're like you can't have a dog in the team and they're like well but you can't you didn't say we can't so haha -ha. right it's it's a it's a kids movie right that came out that was super popular and yeah, it's there's a, a dog named Air Bud, and he's named Air Bud because his name is Bud, and he jumps and dunks basketballs, which is a ridiculous premise to begin with. It's a, such a silly premise. And he's a golden retriever, you know, it's, he's, he's very cute. He's a golden retriever, and the idea, he's, he's an incredibly good basketball player for some ridiculous reason. He's a street dog, okay? He has skills. So then they, they, they get him on the team, and he starts playing on the team as a player, and, you know, the, the of course, the, the bad guys are like, you can't have a dog on your team. And 
They go, where in the rule book does it say we can't have a dog on the team? And the ref goes, you're right. And nowhere does it say you cannot have a dog on the team. Therefore, you are allowed to have a dog on the team. And so, and, and that's become such a, a universal way to say if it's not forbidden, then it's allowed. Mm-hmm. Airbud rules. This is also the beginning of Egwene and Sylviana having interesting conversations rather than just exchanges about beatings and honorifics. They're actually exchanging right. ideas and having a discussion outside of the mistress of novice novice relationship. There's a moment where Sylviana turns to her and goes, "You got me monologuing, you sly mm -hmm. dog." Right? We're like chatting. there is that moment where she's they're talking, we're chatting and she's like, "Get out of here. Not, we're not supposed to be chatting. That was that was uh wrong." But again, it's, you know, Egwene's, the way Egwene is carrying herself and moving through space is subconsciously affecting people. After a week of experiencing her equanimity and her reactions to all this, Sylviana can't help but respond to the inherent authority that Egwene is displaying. It's just, it's creeping in. She can't stop it. Very slowly, very insidiously, but it's happening. There's a certain amount of, of training in the White Tower to bow to authority, and Egwene is taking the authority. She's, you know, what she's learned from the wise ones, yeah. right, that, yeah. that Avienda yeah. still hasn't yeah, yeah. learned, is the only way to get authority is to take it, is to claim it. Yep. And she is claiming that authority, and, and the people around her don't know what to do because they're like, but you're a novice, and you're claiming authority, and it's breaking our brains. But there's no one who's remotely competing on your tier, so right. I guess we're <laughs> going to start falling in line against our own conscious wishes. God damn it. Because, <laughs> again, there's there's a huge gap at the top. Elida yeah, is yeah. not doing anything. And for a while, Alviarin was the leadership at the top, controlling Elida, and there was at least a hand steering it. It was the Black Aja steering it into the rocks, but there was steering going on. And now that we've seen Alviarin in complete punishment mode, and Elida, as we'll, we will see soon, in complete insanity mode, there is, which we can say, you know, Fane might have something to do with that, right? Like, there's no leadership. And so there's a there's a vacuum, and what do we know about power? Like, it fills a vacuum, and Egwene has just been given a lot of power. Yeah, and people like Sylviana are rightfully looking for a leader. She is the mistress of novices. She has a specific role in the government structure to play. She needs there to be a leader, and Elida's not fulfilling that. So she's going to naturally reorient and gravitate to someone who's willing to take on the responsibility correctly. Like, she can't help it. So, I mean, again, if Cad Swain or anyone competent was anywhere near power, this would be a much more difficult struggle for Egwene because she is young and only has six months crash course of swan tutelage. But because El because Elida is so bad at what she needs to be doing, it's, you know, a walk in the park. I mean, a lot of beatings for a walk in the park, but you know, relatively speaking. Yeah. Well, and um, Shamirin was also beaten nearly yes. as often, right, yes. as Egwene was. And she gave that's that she didn't have the fortitude to, to withstand the beatings. She didn't have the mental framework to contextualize the beatings and make it make sense. Because she was in the wrong. In that instance, she was in the wrong. Her friends were trying to beat her sense back into her about claiming her power, but she'd already given her power up, so it was untenable. And that's why she runs away. Um, and then the next thing I have is the readout with the novices giving her honey and the tea. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it bookends that first scene where she gets tripped on her way in. This is a you know effectively a week later, and uh, things have really turned around for her over this over this montage. And, and I feel like a lot of uh, books try and do this like from being bullied to being the hero of the students when they do it over like the course of like a whole school year. And that's the book. And Jordan does it in a couple of sentences at the beginning and ending of a couple of his chapters. And the story is better in my opinion than a lot of other people who tell it. I mean, he, he is a master of his craft. He is. A cushion rested on the bench in front of Egwene's tray, a tattered thing that was more patches in different colors than original material, but still a cushion. Egwene picked it up and set it on the end of the table before sitting down. Welcoming the pain was easy. She basked in the warmth of her own fires. A soft susurration gusted through the room, a collective sigh. Only when she popped an olive into her mouth did the novices sit. She almost spat it out again, 
It was not far short of spoiled, but she was famished after her healing, so she spat only the pit into the palm of her hand and deposited it on the plate, washing the taste away with a sip of tea. There was honey in the tea. Novices got honey only on special occasions. She tried not to smile as she cleaned her plate, and to clean it she did, even picking up crumbs of bread and cheese with a dampened finger. Not smiling was difficult, though. First Doacine, a sitter, then Silviana's resignation, now this. The two sisters were far more important than the novices or the honey, but they all indicated the same thing. She was winning her war. There's one line in here that uh, I did want to talk about that we, we skipped over. She hasn't had any dark or disturbing dreams since she's been rescued. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important to mention. Yes. Being free of the camp has freed her of those headaches and dream problems. And she's had some fine dreams lately about Ran, Matt, Perrin, and even Gawain. Ooh. Though most of her, most of, most dreams of him were just Ooh. that dreams of him prophecy dreams or like what kind of dreams she's having about ran matt perrin and agawan all at the same time hey all i'm hey, saying no Duane, you no, got a dirty mind no, <laughs> no you put that thought down <laughs> put that back where it came from so help me <laughs> terrible <laughs> hey ran no. uh, uh, never no. mind um simply no no so i was watching dune and uh I was like, you know what? I think I know why Rand has three girlfriends. It's because Paul Atreides has two. Because he's got the... Uh, and I'm like, and I bet Jordan was oh, trying to one-up him. My hero's about more women no, than your hero. I, I hate... No, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> no, it has much more to do with the three fates and just many, many other reasons to have three yeah, women. The, yeah. But, I mean, there is so much Dune. There is so much Dune in all of it. It was, it was hard. It, I was watching the, the second Dune movie and just being like, oh, yep, those are, that's. Space that's Aiel, there we go. I said okay. I. Yeah, yeah, Space Aiel, yeah. Benny Gesserit Space are the I, I said I. Spice is the one power, it's addictive. Yeah, you everything know. is settled through sword fights. Yep. Yeah, I still have to watch part two. I like mm-hmm. will eventually. I liked it. I, I, I agree with it. It lacks some soul, in my opinion. I thought amazing movie, love it. But I think someone pointed out that like in movies, people don't have lives anymore. Everything they do is for the plot. Yeah. Well just like T V shows, right? There's no there's no la- none of the weird episodes anymore. Same deal. Yeah. And so it's it's hard I see that now in almost everything I watch where I'm like there's there's nobody having a life. It's like whatever you're doing, you're doing it for the plot, and uh, it's making some of the movies hard for me to watch. Yeah. Like I go back and watch some older stuff, and it's just I'm enjoying it more. I'm not saying it's better, but I'm enjoying older things more. Yeah. Do I sound old yet? God, I was ranting to Brandon this morning about Gen Z truncation of words for like algorithm navigation and how annoying it is to have to carry a decoder ring around everywhere just to like see how people are circumventing the algorithm today and it's just like i'm just entering my old man yelling at kids to get off my lawn phase i guess just like just speak normal english god damn it (laughs) stop gaming the algorithm i hate it (laughs) but that's just me I'm just, I'm just getting old. It's fine. Oh, it's fine. Lilijan, I love that chapter art. The Ooh, five, the seven nice. rings with the seven balls inside. That's Ooh, gorgeous. A good quote too. Yeah, very good quote. That's fantastic. All right, <laughs> are we? Uh, I think we're done. We we petered off there at the end. We we ended to two hours. Uh, yeah, my brain just ran out of juice. Um, yep. Yeah, let's turn recording off. Well, that was two hours.
Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?